perhaps a little later they'll join us online or or on uh, face or not only just Facebook but also YouTube. But uh, we're just happy that you're here. It's a good looking crowd. Y'all looking good today, and uh, you're welcome. You're welcome. Some of you looking better than others. I won't go there. I'm glad you're with us. I'm glad we're, that the Lord is able to meet with us today, and we trust that he will do that this morning in our worship service together. Those of you that can and would, let's stand as our praise team comes, and let's lift our voices and hearts to the Lord in song. A song that Jesus gave me, it was sent from heaven above. There never was a sweeter melody, tis a melody of love. In my heart there rings a melody. My heart a melody, and I know it's there to stay. In my heart there rings a melody, there rings a melody, with heaven's harmony. In my heart there rings a melody, there rings a melody of love. Will be my endless theme in glory. With the angels I will sing. Will be a song with glorious harmony. When the courts of heaven ring. In my heart there rings a melody. There rings a melody with heaven's harmony. In my heart there rings a melody. There rings a melody of love. It's a name I love to hear. I love to sing its word. It sounds like music in my ear. The sweetest name on earth. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me. It tells me what my Father hath in store for every day and though I tread a darksome path you'll sunshine all the way oh how I love Jesus oh how I love Jesus oh how I love Jesus because he first Thank you for singing with us. You may be seated. Our scripture reading this morning, <clears throat> our scripture reading this morning brings us to question 31 and 32 of our Free Will Baptist Catechism. I've chosen to put both of these together because they deal with the Lord's Supper. The answer the Lord's Supper is a memorial celebration of Jesus' death for sinners in which believers eat bread and drink juice that represents Jesus' body and blood given for us on the cross. Question 32, who should participate in the Lord's Supper? 
The answer, only those who have been saved should participate in the Lord's Supper. 1 Corinthians 11, 29 and 30. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, discerning not the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word and the teaching of the Free Will Baptist Catechism. We'll invite our ushers, if you will, please, to come as we receive our in-person offerings today. We remind you of also our opportunity that you have to give through the Tithely app. If you so desire to do that, it, I understand it's a very simple little process you go through and you can give safely and securely uh, through the internet, through that Tithely app. And so, Father, we thank you for the privilege of giving today. We give because you gave, and we give as obedience in uh, the area of stewardship. And so, Lord, I pray you'd help us to be good stewards of that which you put in our care, and that you would, uh, Lord, bless those that have to give as well as, as those that have not. Bless our service today with the presence of your Spirit and may we be very careful to return and give you praise for it all in Jesus' name. If you're willing and able, please stand and join us singing as we continue our worship through song.
Thank you for singing with us. You may be seated. Let's join together in the Gospel of John, chapter number 3, if you will, please. The Gospel of John, chapter number 3. Thank you so much for the extra time to preach today. I've got 45 minutes. And uh, it reminds me of a cartoon I read this week. I was feeling kind of low, and so I grabbed one of my cartoon books off of the bookshelf. And uh, it's called Funny Bloopers and Stories for Pastors. Uh, first one I flipped to, it said, you know how your congregation feels when they expect you to preach 30 minutes and you win an hour? And I thought, yeah, I know how they feel. <coughs> so today you've given me almost the hour, so I don't have to worry about it, do I? <laughs> and I promise you, I promise you, I won't keep you that long. You're going to get out early today, okay? Happy Valentine's Day. You're going to get out early. Uh, today. It's almost like Christmas in February because you're going to get out early. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's God's Valentine. It's his Valentine for you. And it's his valentine for me. While there are many questions that surround this holiday that we know as Valentine's Day, we understand through legend that it gets its name from St. Valentine. St. Valentine was a priest that lived under the reign of the Roman Emperor Claudius II. Claudius II passed a law that all young men should remain single in order that it would make them better soldiers in Claudius' army. St. Valentine supposedly broke the emperor's law and secretly performed marriages. The legend also says that while he was imprisoned for this crime, people would slip him little notes written on folded pieces of paper and, they would, and he would hide them in the cracks of the rocks of his cell. From this legend, we get the valentine. We get the holiday. We have what we are celebrating today, tomorrow, and maybe even further. This next quote you can take for whatever you want. It's a, it's a famous quote of your pastor. In our day, Valentine's has become a commercial conspiracy against us husbands and boyfriends that is spearheaded by the chocolate, greeting card, floral, and jewelry industries. By the way, men... Don't forget tomorrow, have you bought your roses and your chocolate and your stuffed animals and all that good kind of stuff yet? I'm glad you have. I've started, but I have not finished. I will, though. Well, today we open the Word of God to undoubtedly one of the most familiar scriptures in the Bible. It's what I've already described to you that might be called God's Valentine. It's a love note, if you would, from God. It contains only 25 words, yet those 25 words, in my opinion, speak more than volumes of books in the library. It's a verse that's very familiar. It's a verse almost to the fact that, and to be right honest with you, it's a verse that I said, God, I have preached from John 3.16 so many times, these folks don't want to hear another sermon from 3.16. Give me something different. And God kept bringing me back to John 3.16. But it's one of those familiar 
verses. Yet to me, it's a subject that's always fresh. It's something I always see differently every time I read these 25 verses. And so though we've looked at it many times, I still believe it's going to be sweet in our ears to hear John 3.16 one more time. So with Valentine's Day in our minds, the events of this day, I want us to take a look one more time at God's Valentine. There are three truths that I see from John 3.16 that I want to share with you this morning. Number one, God's love is supernatural love. God's love is a supernatural love. I think you'll agree with me today. Love is a word that we have unfortunately devalued in our culture. We are apt to ascribe love to almost anything. I love that sports team or I absolutely love that kind of food. But the fact is, love means so much more than that. In John 3, 16, Jesus describes love in this fashion. He says, for God so loved. Now, what kind of love was Jesus talking about when he said that God so loved? Well, he was talking about a divine love. A love that was supernatural. It was a love that was something unusual. There was something distinct about the love of God couple things we could say about God's love being supernatural. God's love is supernatural in the fact of its origin. It's supernatural in its origin. In John 3.16, the subject of the sentence is God. He is the one that is doing or giving the love. For God so loved. The love in this case originates with God. Again, God so loved. Now think about it with me for just a moment. An, an absolutely holy God. One who has no wrong in him. One who has no sin, no iniquity. He is perfection personified. He is purity in its holiest form and highest form. That's the God that we're serving. And yet, he loves fallen, filthy, fragile men and women like you and I. God so loved. There's something supernatural about this love because God loved you and I when we were unlovable. And yet today, God has so much love for us. And God's love for us just comes naturally to him. He loves us. Karl Barth, he's a, he was a Protestant theologian back in the day. He, uh, Karl Barth was born in 1886, died in 1968. Great theologian. He was asked this question one day. What is the greatest thought? that you've ever had come to your mind. Now, if you think of a great Protestant theologian and he's asked the question, what is the greatest thought that's ever come to your mind? You would expect some major theological truth to come out of his mouth, wouldn't you? Here's what he said. Jesus loves me. This I know. Because the Bible tells me so. <laughs> the greatest truth from a theologian that I don't even know, but I just read about him. What a great thought. Jesus loves me, this I know, because the Bible tells me so. You see, the love that's described in John 3.16 is a supernatural love because it originates with a supernatural God. God so but not only is God's love supernatural in, in its origin, but number two, it's, it's supernatural in its order. In its order. And reading on that passage, for God so loved the world. The world. 
Paul put it this way to the Ephes or to uh, the Romans in Romans chapter five, verse number eight, which uh, absolutely summarizes what it means in John three sixteen that He loved the world. Romans five eight, but God commendeth His love to us to us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God's love is supernatural in its order because His love is not conditioned on anything you and I are. You see, you, I think you understand this, but let me just make sure we're all on the same page. You and I love when something prompts us to love. You and I love when we find somebody attractive. You and I love when something warrants our love. We love... Only if the person that we're loving can love us back. And yet God says, I love you. Even when you're filthy, rotten sinners, I still love you. The order of God's love, as Paul put it to the Romans, while we were yet sinners. You see, God loves us before any warrant or reason that we give Him to love us. He loves you and He loves me and He loves the entire world, even those times when we were unlovely. God's love is, uh, is initially, and His love is indefinitely. Uh, John put it this way in 1 John 4.19, he says, we love him, that is, we love God, because he first loved us. You understand what John's saying there? God looked down through the portals of history and he saw you and he saw me and he says, man, I love that person. Even though we were still in our sin. I don't answer this question out loud. I wouldn't want to embarrass anybody in this particular setting, though... I wouldn't put it past me tonight at our banquet, but in this particular setting, uh, I don't want you to answer this out loud, but do you remember the first time that your heart beamed with love for someone? Now, I'm not going to go back through all of my previous relationships, girlfriends, call it what you want to, because I know you folks, you'll run straight to the children's church and tell Denna all about it. So I'll just be present. I remember the first time I saw Denna. Wow! Wow! Matter of fact, the first time I saw her, I'm honest as I can be. I said, I am going to marry that woman. I'm going to marry her. And uh, of course, the first time she saw me, she about fainted and said, I'm going to marry that man. But no, I don't know. I don't know about that. Uh, but think about the question for a moment. Do you remember the first time your heart beamed with love for someone? Can I tell you why it beamed? It was because there was a motivating factor that attracted you to that individual. Yet, God loves you and I without a starting point. God loves us without that motivating factor. He looks down at the alcoholic that's lying in the streets this morning or in the gutters who cannot reciprocate love back to God. And God looks at them and says, I love them even though they don't love me. And my dear friends, let me say to all of us here and watching online, there was a time when all of us were in sin. And yet God, even though we didn't recognize Him and we did not reciprocate love to Him, God in His throne of heaven looked down and loved the world. He loved you. God's, God's love is supernatural in its, in its origin. It, it comes from God. His, his love is supernatural in its order because He loves the entire world. But, but secondly, in John 3.16, I want you to notice that God's love is a sacrificial love. 
It's a sacrificial love. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. These words teach us that God loved us so much that he didn't just say it out loud. He did something about it. He loved us so much that he gave. Now, the word love in John 3, 16 could be a noun or it could be a verb. When you study the Greek, which I know just enough to get me in trouble, the word loved in John 3, 16 is a verb. It's an action verb. God's love is sacrifice. He gave love. Let me say a couple things about the love of, of God as he gave. Num number one, it's an amazing sacrifice. He gave his only begotten son. It's an amazing sacrifice. Now, some of you are going to be able to understand this. and Others of you will not have a clue, but maybe someday you will, but... At times, I didn't say all the time, but at times, would you not agree with me, children can be annoying and frustrating at times? Anybody with me? You understand? Yeah, I see those hands. They can be frustrating and annoying. Faith, I won't talk about your kids, but I'll talk about mine. Faith and hope. My word. Annoying. Frustrating. By the grace of God, they're still alive today. Do you understand? Rachel's back there just dying laughing. because I, I, And I don't mean to point her out, but we've had some discussions in the last few weeks. I know. And uh, just, hey, hey, Stephen and Casey, just wait. It's coming. Just, just hang on. Just trying to encourage you today. Just trying to help you. Trying to be the pastor that I need to be. But I'm going to tell you what. Faith and hope at times. At times, I, I, honestly, I could have just ripped their heads off. Because they were so annoying and so frustrating and just aggravating. But can I tell you something? And, and it's true. It, it was true all these years. And it is still true to this very moment. There is nothing on earth more precious to this daddy than faith and hope. And I would, and I, I don't say this to get an amen. I don't say this to let you think I'm some superhero or anything like that. I say this because I mean it. There is nothing that I wouldn't do if I had to lay down my life to help and save those two children of mine. I'd do it right now. If I could. And if I needed to. I'd do it without hesitation. I'd lay down my life. In order to spare their lives from harm. I, I, you, you may not understand. You wouldn't. Most likely. You might. But you, you might lay down your life. For faith or hope. Or you may not. But I guarantee you. You would lay down your life. For your children. To keep them out of harm's way. You know why we do that? is because we love them only the way that a parent can love their children. And to, and to be truthful with you, I've read it a million times, John 3, 16, and every time I read it, I am amazed, I am astonished, I am startled at the fact that God would give His only Son as a sacrifice because he loved me and he loves you. Paul said in Romans chapter 8 verse number 32 that God did not spare his own son but delivered him up for us all. John Newton was born in 1725 in England. John, Newton, John Newton's father was a shipmaster who owned and sailed slave ships. John, when he got old enough, followed in the footsteps of his father and became a sailor. Also, 
having slaves on his ships. John Newton, in his very own testimony, describes himself as an infidel and admitted that he had no spiritual life and he did not believe in this supernatural God that people were talking about. But somewhere in the middle of the ocean one night, John caught himself in the midst of one of the fiercest storms he had ever been in in his life. Not knowing what to do, John Newton went down to the bottoms of that, that ship got on his knees and said, God, I really don't know if you exist or not, but if you do, will you first of all save my soul? And secondly, will you save me from this storm? Do you know what happened? John Newton got saved that night. God called him to preach. And in in 1779... John Newton is sitting in the study of his local church where he was pastoring, preparing a sermon. And John Newton wrote these words. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. You see, when we consider the immeasurable sacrifice that God gave His only Son, Jesus Christ. I can't think of any other word to describe it except amazing. It's God's amazing sacrifice and His amazing grace that saves our souls. God's love is a sacrificial love in the fact that it's an amazing sacrifice, but number two, it's also an appropriate sacrifice. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. It's an appropriate sacrifice because no other sacrifice would do. There, it, it was an appropriate sacrifice because Jesus was the only perfect sacrifice that could take away the sins of the world. It, yeah. I don't know what you men do around Valentine's Day, and I always put it on the men. I think women ought to buy the men stuff just as well on on Valentine's Day. Amen. Amen. Just bring it on. Bring it on. But but one thing I do, I do this at Christmas. I do it on a birthday. I do it other times. But even on Valentine's Day, I try to get dinner the most perfect Valentine gift I can get. That's why I'm not finished shopping yet, because I'm still looking for that perfect Valentine gift. And I know what I'm looking for, I just hadn't found it yet, but I'll find it. But I thought, well, what if I don't find it? Uh, what's the perfect Valentine gift I can get Get uh, dinner? And so I did what every red-blooded man would do. I Googled it. I Googled perfect Valentine gifts for your wife. And the very first one that popped up, I said, that's not it. Because the very first one that popped up was a vacuum cleaner. (laughs) And you women excited, you might get a vacuum cleaner. But that was the very first perfect Valentine's gift was a vacuum cleaner. I thought, how stupid is this? And so I clicked on it. I I mean, I'm just dumb enough to do that. I clicked on it because I wanted to see the comments listed and and who, by, by some chance in the world, I might know the guy that bought his wife a vacuum cleaner. And so I clicked on it. And it brought down this little story, and uh, I didn't know the guy, but what he did, he said, yes, yes, I bought my wife a vacuum cleaner for Valentine's Day, but it wasn't just any old vacuum cleaner. I had her name engraved on it. (laughs) Fellers, that's not the perfect Valentine's gift. I don't care if you do have her name engraved on the front of it. But can I submit to you this morning that God gave us the perfect, appropriate gift when he gave us Jesus Christ. You and I needed a Savior and God sent him. And so the chorus writer wrote, oh, what a Savior. Oh, hallelujah. 
His heart was broken on Calvary. His hands were nail scarred. His side was riven. And that he gave his life's blood for you. God's love is a sacrificial love. It's an amazing sacrifice. It's an appropriate sacrifice. But the third truth that I see in this passage is, number three, God's love is a saving love. It's a saving love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. What makes the love of God the most remarkable? What makes the love of God the most remarkable is that when we respond to it in faith, the sacrifice becomes our salvation. When we respond to God's love by faith, the sacrifice becomes our salvation. And God's love is a saving love. It's a saving love in in the fact that, number one, it proclaims an unlimited reach. Do you notice what the Bible says? That whosoever believeth. I'm thankful for a whosoever type of salvation, aren't you? I'm glad I don't have to be somebody. I'm glad that, uh, you know, even though the scriptures teach and tell us that God has predestinated. That just simply means God already knows who's going to get saved and who's not going to get saved. But I want to tell you, I couldn't lay my head down on the pillow at night and go to sleep if I had to worry about whether I was one of God's elect or not. I know I'm one of God's elect because I knelt at an altar and asked him to save my soul. And when I did, he wrote my name down in the Lamb's Book of Life. And and I'm on my way to heaven. You know... The, the, the salvation is not just for the lovely, it's not just for the wealthy, it's not just for the healthy, it's for everybody. God doesn't limit his love. God loves everybody. Listen, this morning the gate is wide open to whosoever may enter in. It's an unlimited reach. The love of God is a love for whosoever. It reaches the religious man, but it also reaches the reprobate. The love of God reaches the decent man, but it also reaches the depraved man. The love of God opens heaven for the low class, the no class, and the outcast. Again, I go to the hymn book, and the songwriter said, I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves even You take that little word, me, and you put your name in there because God loves you too. It's an unlimited reach. Letter B, God's love is a saving love not only because it proclaims an unlimited reach, but it also provides an unending rescue. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him, what's the last part? Should not perish, but have everlasting life. Notice in your Bible that word perish. Perish is exactly what all of us should happen to us. We ought to perish. Because the Adam nature is in us and because we are sinners without Christ, every one of us deserve to die and go to hell and perish. We've broken God's law. We've rebelled against Him. The the justice calls for us to perish in our sins. But don't stop right there. Hang on with me. Yet God has rescued us from our sins. Amen? We put our faith and trust in Him, and instead of us perishing, He rescues us. And in the love of Christ, the Bible says we receive everlasting life. That word everlasting in John 3.16, the Greek word simply means something with no end. It'll never end. When you think about everlasting life, and I think about my natural life and your natural life... One of these days, if Jesus doesn't come first, 
One of these days, this body's going to cease to function. My heart will pump the last ounce of blood. These lungs will exhale the last little bit of air that I have. The activity in my brain will cease. And at that moment, the doctor will declare me dead. But listen to me. I can't die. <laughs> Not in the sense that I will never die physically, but in the sense that the love of God has given me an unending rescue from death, hell, and the grave. I will live forever. And thank God, because of his unending rescue, I will live forever in a place called heaven because I have put my faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. By the way, my dear friends, you will live somewhere forever too. And you have a choice this morning whether you're going to live in eternity in heaven or whether you'll live eternity in hell. And you've got to make that decision before that heart pumps its last ounce of blood. Before those lungs breathe out the last little bit of breath. Before your brain ceases to function. You've got to make a decision. It's a personal decision on your part and your part alone. Is if you'll put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Well... Let me just wrap this all up. Let me just bring this to a conclusion. Uh, in many ways, in many ways, I feel that when I try to describe the love of God, I, I fall so short. Uh, the love of God is so big. It, it is so powerful. It is so unusual. In, in my little finite mind, it even is so incomprehensible. But God sent us a Valentine that we could know just what Valentine's Day is all about. And so the best explanation for the love of God can only be found in the words of God himself. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everything. Those that pick out our songs uh, for Sunday morning had no clue what my sermon was going to be about today, but the invitation this morning that we're going to sing together goes right along with this sermon. We're going to sing how deep the Father's love for us. And if you're here today and you have some need in your life, I want you to know these altars are open to you. Mainly if you're here and you've never accepted God's valentine, that is, Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. I want to invite you to come. Let somebody pray with you and show you how you can become a child of God. Father, I pray today that you would take this invitation time and speak to our hearts. Help us to be obedient and bold in our decision for you. Let us be quick to make those decisions today. May God, you receive glory and honor in our invitational time today. And may we be holy and perfectly obedient to how you lead us. So help us now, Holy Spirit, to follow your lead during this time of invitation. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together and sing this song. How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that He should give His only Son to make a wretch His treasure. How great the pain of searing loss, the Father turns His face away As wounds that mar the Chosen One 
bring many sons to glory. Behold the man upon a cross, my sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished his dying breath has brought me life i know that it is finished i will not boast in anything no gifts no power no wisdom but I will boast in Jesus Christ, His death and resurrection. Why should I gain from His reward? I cannot give an answer, but this I know with all my heart. His wounds have paid my ransom. Please be seated right where you are for just a few moments as we look at some announcements together. First thing I want to do is uh, put an announcement on the screen. And so 